I now move on to one last funny thing before we get serious. The chemistry cat of the day from quickmeme.com. Argon walks into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve noble gases here. Argon doesn't react. <laughs> Thank you, quickmeme.com. After today's presentation, which will cover sections 4 to 8 of chapter 8, you should be able to predict chemical formulas for ionic compounds, predict trends in lattice energies, define electronegativity and no electronegativity trends on the periodic table, define polarity and sort different bonds by their polarities, and know how to calculate reaction enthalpies from individual bond enthalpies. Now you should note that we will skip section 8.7. I also won't be teaching you anything about resonance because we'll discuss that in depth in Chem 2310, which is organic chemistry. So with that said, we'll go ahead and get started by talking about ionic formulas. Now you should remember that a covalent compound, also called a molecular compound, is one in which you have two non-metals bonded to each other. If you have a metal bonded to a non-metal, and remember that non-metals are located in this small triangular section on the right side of the periodic table, and metals comprise the bulk of the remaining elements on the periodic table. So please keep in mind that distinction. Now, in order to predict the chemical formulas of ionic compounds, we have to follow these steps. One, determine what charge each element will preferentially form as a cation or anion based on its location on the periodic table. For example, sodium will form sodium plus, not sodium 2 plus, because it's located in column 1A of the periodic table. Aluminum, by comparison, will form aluminum 3 plus, not aluminum 2 plus, because it's in column 3A of the periodic table. Similarly, chlorine will form a Cl minus ion, or chloride anion, and not a Cl2 minus ion, because it's in group 7A of the periodic table, and so forth. Step two, write the cation on the left and the anion on the right in the formula. And step three, if necessary, Add subscripts next to the cation and anion to ensure that their total combined charges equal zero. For example, if I combine a cation A with a charge of plus x and an anion B with a charge of minus y, then I can combine them as follows to get an overall zero charge. Putting A with a plus x charge together with B with a minus y charge, I end up with a final formula of AYBX. In other words, the charge of B ends up being the subscript of A, and the charge on A ends up being the subscript of B, with the negatives and positives removed. This, of course, heralds back to something we learned back in Chapter 2. If I have a cation A with a charge of plus x and an anion B with a charge of plus y, I once again just use these charges as the subscripts for their counterparts, A and B, as shown here to give me my final formula. We now arrive at a problem. Predict the chemical formula of the ionic compound formed between the following pairs of elements. Now, as I'm going to show you the answers to a couple of these examples momentarily, if you wish, you can pause the video right now and attempt to do them on your own first. Here's our first example, aluminum and fluorine. You'll note that aluminum is in group 3A of the periodic table. It's also a metal, which means that it generally wants to lose electrons. Because it's in that group, it's going to lose three electrons to feel like the preceding noble gas, neon. Thus, the most stable cation of aluminum has a charge of plus three. Because fluorine appears in group 7A of the periodic table, it wants to gain one electron to feel like the nearest noble gas, also neon. Thus, fluorine's most stable ionic charge will be negative one. How do we put those together to get an overall neutral charge? Well, of course, we're going to have a formula of AlF3. Here's another example, lithium and nitrogen. Lithium is in group 1A of the periodic table, which means it's going to want to have a charge of plus one, while nitrogen is in group 5A of the periodic table, which means it's going to want to gain electrons to feel like the nearest noble gas, neon. Thus, Nitrogen's most stable ionic charge is going to be minus three. When I throw those two guys together, I end up getting a balanced formula of Li3M. I'll let you do parts B and D on your own. We're now going to move on to another subject, but before doing so, I want to lighten the mood a little bit by showing you one more chemistry cat from quickmeme.com. Iron Man? You mean female? <laughs> 
Oh yeah, if you don't get it, there's a problem with your chemistry education. Now we'll talk about lattice energy. The attraction between positively and negatively charged ions makes ionic compounds very stable. These compound stabilities are measured by their lattice energy, which is simply defined the energy required to completely separate one mole of a solid ionic compound into its individual ions in a gaseous state. For example, if you take sodium chloride solid and separate out all of the sodium cations from all of the chloride anions, and then in that process vaporize them to a gaseous form, the total amount of energy required is 788 kilojoules per mole of sodium chloride. Now you should notice that this process is extremely endothermic. What this means is that rather than giving off heat, this process requires a tremendous amount of heat put into it, as you can well imagine. That also means that the reverse process, combining sodium cation and chloride anions to form sodium chloride solid, will be very exothermic by the exact same amount in reverse. This table shows us a number of lattice energies for various ionic compounds. As we analyze it, you'll notice, for example, that separating sodium and fluoride requires 910 kilojoules per mole. Separating magnesium and oxide requires 3795 kilojoules per mole. Separating cesium from iodide requires 600 kilojoules per mole, and so forth and so on. One of the trends you should notice is this. The numbers get very, very big for these compounds over here. Notice for scandium nitride, the number is huge. I wonder why that is. Think about it momentarily as I'm going to provide you with the answer shortly. Lattice energy, which is also called in our book E sub EL, can be described using the following mathematical equation. E sub EL equals kappa times Q1, Q2 divided by D, where kappa is some constant, and Q1 and Q2 are the individual charges of the individual ions, the cation and the anion, and D is the distance between their nuclei. Now, if you analyze this formula mathematically, you'll see a couple of things. First of all, if I increase Q1 and Q2, it's going to increase the lattice energy. If I increase the bond distance, it will decrease the lattice energy. If I decrease the bond distance, it will increase the lattice energy. And if I decrease the charges, Q1 and Q2, it will decrease the lattice energy. Thus, we can see that the lattice energy increases as the charges on the ions increase, and as their radii, or bonding distance, decreases. Now, that should make sense logically if you think about it. And now we'll go and reanalyze what we saw on the previous table. Notice here that all of the compounds shown in this leftmost column have cations with plus one charges and anions with negative one charges you can see the type of lattice energies that we get out. When we go over here, magnesium has a plus two charge, and each chloride has a minus one charge. Notice how large the lattice energy increases. What that means is that in order to break apart those two ions, magnesium and chloride, it's harder to do than it is for a lithium chloride, for example, because magnesium has a plus two charge rather than just a plus one. I hope that makes sense. If you've got a plus two charge, it's harder to pull you away than if you just got a plus one charge. Notice as we increase the charge of the anion, magnesium has a plus two and oxide has a minus two. The lattice energies increase significantly. And as we go all the way up to scandium nitride, where each of these ions have a plus three and minus three charge, the lattice energy is very, very huge. Trying to pull a plus three charge cation away from a minus three anion is very, very difficult to do. That brings us to this question. Explain the following trends in lattice energy. In part A, we can see that sodium chloride has a stronger lattice energy than rubidium bromide, which has a stronger lattice energy than cesium bromide. Why is that the case? In order to answer that, we should remember the equation from the previous slide, that once again, as we increase charges or decrease the bonding distance, lattice energy goes up. You'll notice that for the examples in part A, every single cation has a plus one charge, and every single anion has a minus one charge. So there's no difference in their charges from one to the next. 
Thus, their charges can't be contributing to the differing trend in lattice energy. So what is it then? It must be the bonding distance. Notice that rubidium, cesium, and sodium are all in the same column of the periodic table. But they get larger as we go down that column. Rubidium is larger than sodium, and cesium is the largest of all. Furthermore, bromine is even larger in size than chlorine. What that means is that the bond distance D between rubidium and bromine is much larger than that between sodium and chlorine. And the bonding distance between cesium and bromine is even larger than that of rubidium and bromine. Thus, the reason we see the lattice energy E, E sub L, decreasing going from left to right here is because the bonding distance in each of these compounds is increasing. I'll leave it up to you to see if you can come up with an explanation for the trends observed in parts B and C. All right, so that's the end of this video, but don't worry, there's more to come. Please stay tuned, and until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.